All right, buenos dias. All right, today I'm gonna play a little clip from this guy here, about a minute and a half, and I want to walk through it a little bit and uh, show the error, and then I'm gonna walk you through the truth. So here we go. Well, what about during the millennium? Meantime. For those, particularly for those persecuted by the forces of evil and martyred for their faith in Jesus, verse 4, and I instinctively think of those gruesome executions on a Libyan beach back in 2015. Though there's an ambiguity in the original text, and for instance in English, if you're using the English Standard Version instead of the New International Version, Possibly also... Uh, okay, so first of all, there is no original text. You hear this quite often. It's incredible. Show me the original text. They don't exist. At all. There is no original text. Period. You couldn't show them to me if your life depended on them because they do not exist. If we wanted to get real technical, Moses smashed the original text. All right, so uh, so anytime somebody points to an ESV or international version, the NIV, the this tells me they don't believe in any Bible at all. There is no original text, and you cannot say the ESV and the NIV are the pure words of God. They are full of omissions and errors. I suspect there's a second group. Not just those who are martyred, but those who live faithfully to Christ all the way... Alright, so, notice what he said here. Not just those who are martyred. Possibly also, I suspect there's a second group. Not just those who are martyred. But those who live faithfully to Christ all. So he's adding to the book of Revelation. He's saying, I suspect there's a second group. Speaking of Revelation uh, verses, uh, Revelation 20, excuse me, verses 4 through 6. So let me get you to that chapter. All right. So he's talking about Revelation 20. And here in verse 4 it says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Now, what he's saying is, I suspect there's a second group. He's adding to the book of Revelation. And that's sort of what I want to walk you through here today, that there is no second group all right and it's completely ignorant and this idea is contrary to the word of god so first of all let's go find a verse here somewhere in the bible it says add thou not unto his words lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar all right, and so this guy is found to be a liar. And it's one thing to be ignorant. But man, when you make a statement like that, you are flat out lying. And we're warned against that. It's unbelievable. And it's, I just wonder about these people. Have they never read the Bible? Why are you preaching the Bible if you don't know what it says? It's incredible. Now, in Revelation 22, it says, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And this fella is adding a second group to Revelation 20. And... It's completely ignorant of what the of the what the 
you know, the, the verses are saying, the, what Revelation 20 is saying overall. The context is everything, right? Okay, I'm going to walk you through this. And you're going to see that it's really very simple. It's not complicated. It's not something we can't know for sure with certainty. We can know with absolute certainty what this text is talking about. There's just one caveat, I guess, if you will, and that is you have to have faith. Without faith, you're not going to be able to see anything. You're blind without faith. And that's all throughout the Bible as well. All right, before I get off target here, let's let's take a look at something here. Um, where do I want to go here? All right, so he's claiming that there is a second group in Revelation 20, and there's clearly not. So uh, I think it's important... Um, First of all, let's establish something before we walk through this, okay? Let's establish something, and that is, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So, therefore, we are all going to stand before God on judgment day. And the judgment day is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. All right. Now, a lot of liars will tell you it's after, it's a thousand years after Jesus comes. That's not true at all. And I'll show it to you. But I want to establish the fact that there is one judgment, one judgment day. And that's where everybody gets judged. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the, <laughs> all, this is, it seems like people just don't want to accept the fact that all means all. And here's another example. We shall all, all means all. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And look, man, you have, you have to accept the fact that all means all. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. In Mark 13, verse 37, And what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. All means all. Everybody from the beginning to the end, all means all. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All means all. All right. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And it's interesting in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. This judgment is at the end of the world. Why were the disciples so curious when Jesus was talking to them and saying that every stone... Oh, oh I'm sorry. What's he say? Let me go here in uh, Mark 13. Uh, he's talking about how not one stone shall be left upon another. Talking about the buildings in Israel. Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Again, not one stone. 
Not one stone means not one stone. <clears throat> All right, the Bible means what it says. And this is going to happen at the end of the world. And this is why they ask him, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of when all these things shall be fulfilled? And what they're asking is ex ex exactly what we're reading in Matthew 24, when they say, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? All right, so that's exactly what Jesus explains to them. That at the end of the world, all these things are going to be destroyed. Everything on earth will be destroyed. All right. And then, of course, I can go to Second Peter chapter 3 and see that when Jesus comes... The elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also. And the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing that all these things, all these things shall be dissolved, right? <laughs> Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And then, of course, and this is Judgment Day. Then, of course, after the judgment of God comes the new heavens and the new earth. And we read about that in Revelation 21. Right? And we can easily draw a parallel with this here, Revelation 21, verse 1, and 2 Peter 3, verse 13. And then we can also draw a parallel with Isaiah 65, where it says, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. And also in 66, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. All right, so there's coming a new heaven and a new earth. Make no mistake about it. All right, and this will happen when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Now, in Matthew 13, Jesus gives us some great parables. And one of the great parables he gives is the parable of the wheat and the tares. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sirs, did not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then has it tares? He saith unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. All right, so the harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels, the wheat are the saved, the terrors are the unsaved, and at the end of the world is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Make no mistake about that. Because this is consistent all throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 
can we see that Jesus is the resurrection? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming then comes the end so when Jesus comes it is the end of the world make no mistake about it this is consistent all throughout the Bible all right so I mean this is it's really pretty simple because we're getting the, the same scenario all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation from Genesis to Revelation we are being told about the end of this world when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's consistent all throughout the Bible Genesis 3 verse 15 I will put enmity and this is the Lord speaking to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel this is when God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent and destroying all evil forever all right this is consistent all throughout the Bible right when Jesus comes it's the end of the world for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet right and it shall bruise thy heel all we have to do is connect the dots now the what's gonna slow you up is if you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands if you don't believe that the words are from God how can you understand anything right and I think that's the one thing people don't want to believe that the, the God's real that the Spirit of God is absolutely real and the Bible that we hold in our hands is directly from God for whatever reason people don't want to believe it well, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I think it's because they want to change and dictate the Word of God. But they can't. John 6, verse 63, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Now, we you should already know that the Word of God is powerful. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is God. Alright? The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is just not... It doesn't come from man. The Bible comes from God above, directly. Just as... God gave Moses tables of stone written with the finger of God directly from God to Moses. So also does our Bible, the King James Bible, come directly from God. And without that faith, how can you understand anything? You get all kinds of confusion like this fella. This is, I mean... <laughs> In the beginning of this video, he talks about how the, the great, what's he called, a great controversy or infamous, the infamous millennium, because there's this great debate. Well, there shouldn't be any debate. You, know, you got a bunch of people that don't believe the Bible debating 
what Revelation 20 is talking about. They're confused. They're in a state of confusion because they don't want to believe what the Bible says. And what rev what the you know essentially the whole Bible or book of Revelation contradicts these Hollywood movies that these guys are watching. Yeah, these movies about war and uh, the end of the world coming with you know a massive war and you know whatever you know um, I don't know any of the movies but there are a bunch of movies out there that uh, uh, portray this idea that there's going to be a great b deal of violence and that's going to sp uh, spur on the end of the world heck we see that in the news broadcast as well massive war and then the end of the world comes that's not what Jesus says at all that's completely contrary to what Jesus says isn't it as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man right for in the days of Noah they were eating and drinking just carrying on about this about their daily lives and then the flood came and destroyed them all so also will it be when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we're gonna be carrying on in our lives just like today alright so let's get back to this here let's just go to Revelation 20 was there something else I wanted to share perhaps uh, I'll get to that here in a second all right I just want to establish the fact that we are all going to stand before God at the judgment day when he comes in the clouds of heaven make no mistake about it you can't get around it when Jesus comes it's the end of the world there's no way to get around it no way to skate no no way to uh, the only way to get around it is just a flat-out lie that's the only way when Jesus comes the elements shall melt with fervent heat just as God destroyed the world by water in the days of Noah's God will destroy this world by fire when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You cannot get around it. Right, the only way to get around it is to lie, really. Okay, so let's walk through. Revelation 20 and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottom was put in a great chain in his hand Now this is another vision given to John by the angel to show us Things which must shortly come to pass. All right, we know that from reading Revelation 1 verse 1 All right, and he laid a hold on the dragon that old serpent that old serpent and we read about that old serpent way back in Genesis 3 that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut, up, and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season well this is the more I think about it this more simple this is really if you know the history of the Bible you know that there was one nation of God right there was one nation one nation of God all right one nation of God and that was Israel right well so you want to say there was two kingdoms at one point then there was one kingdom there was one kingdom and then two kingdoms and one kingdom there was just really one nation of God one people of God if you will okay there really was and 
uh, I, I get it. There was uh, a lot of things happening, but at the end of the day, there was one group of people. And outside of that group of people um, were nations that were not nations of God. Okay? Now, I mean, how do I say this? Okay, there was 12 nations of God, and then one nation of God, and two nations, and so on and so forth. But within that group of people was the kingdom of God. Outside of that kingdom of God were nations deceived. Now, in Exodus 19, God says, You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. All right, so that of all the children of Israel, they were a holy nation. Make no mistake about that. All right, so again, I feel like I'm, if you're new to this, uh, this could be very useful. If you know the Bible, you should already know what I'm sharing with you. All right, so we can go to First Peter. Oh, oh, forgive me. I should know this as well, huh? I should know this as well. So in, oh, goodness sakes. What am I looking for? Oh, okay. I forgot what I was looking for. Huh. First Peter two, excuse me. First Peter two. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people. Right. This is talking about those of us that are Christians. Right. So go back to Exodus 19. Oh, for dog's sakes. Here, let's do it this way. I apologize for that. In Exodus 19, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Okay, so... Before Jesus came along, there was one group of people, the children of Israel, which represented the kingdom of God. All right, then comes Jesus. Let's see if I can find this verse. In Matthew 21, he says, Therefore I say unto you, let me find it. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Talking about the group of people, it no longer is the kingdom of God just within a group of people. Now the kingdom of God is available to all people all over the world. Hence, this is why Jesus says, go and preach the gospel to every creature. All right. He also says, in the, in the gospel shall be preached in every, um, among all nations, right? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Right, so no longer is the kingdom of God within one group of people. The kingdom of God is available all over the world. Now I was going to show some images of um, uh, the nation of Israel before Jesus and then uh, get into that. You know, um, I'm not sure that there's a real good way to teach this, but it, should be, it shouldn't be controversial at all, really. Um, I mean, without the imagery, you ought to already know, right, that there was one group of people 
that was the king of God. And now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Alright, so Jesus comes and he binds the strong man, which is Satan. Alright, he binds him. And now Satan cannot deceive the nations outside of the kingdom of God any longer. Until, yeah, that's right, until the thousand years are finished. All right. So, uh, to me, this is just incredible. How is it that it seems like nobody can see the simplicity of this, really? So, anyways. So, yeah, that's right. You got it, buddy. Good job. Now, so the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, here in Matthew 12 and Mark 3, um, Jesus talks about um, the kingdom uh, being divided. Let's get into this here. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. And he that is not against me, and he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathered not, not with me scattereth abroad. So, okay. Now think about this. Think of the world as the strong man's house. Now here comes Jesus, and he has bound the strong man, and now... He has made available the kingdom of God to whosoever believes in him. Alright? So now the kingdom of God is available to everybody. Everybody all around the world. So there's no longer one nation of God and then outside of that nation are nations deceived by the devil, by Satan that no longer exist. This is a big, huge difference between now and what it was like before Jesus was on earth. Alright, it's a huge difference. And there was a huge difference between, uh, you know, what it was like before the flood and then after the flood. There's a huge difference between what it was like before Jesus and what it's like now. And there's going to be an even greater difference between the life that we're in now and the life that is to come. All right, and the life that is to come is the everlasting kingdom. The kingdom that lasts forever. Okay. All right, so... I hope that's pretty clear. Yeah, you know, I could, I feel like I could explain this a hundred different ways, but I'm really seeing the same thing, and that is here in Revelation 20, when it says that Satan is bound for a thousand years. It's all it's saying is that he no longer controls nations outside of the kingdom of God any longer. That's because Jesus has come and bound the strong man. It's because he, Jesus has come and made the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. All right, and then after Satan must be loosed a little season, now we're going to read what happens when he's loosed. But let's start, let's read verse 4. And it says, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Now, I saw thrones that are, thrones are people that are kings, alright? That, I mean, there's really, it's not 
Rocket science? Really? It's not rocket science at all. Uh, did you read Revelation chapter 1? Because before you get to Revelation chapter 20, you ought to read Revelation chapter 1. Now I showed you in 1 Peter chapter 2, where it says uh, it talks about we are a royal priesthood. Right? Revelation chapter 20 says, and I saw the and I saw thrones. Revelation 1, verse 6. And he had Jesus has made us kings and priests unto God. Right? So we are kings unto God right now. And we are a kingdom of priests. We are in holy nation. All right, this is consistent all throughout the Bible. And they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And again, this is another reason why it's important to have a King James Bible and to believe that the Bible is from God, because it is. All right, so let's go to verse 20 five or 26 or what verse do we want to go to yeah right there 26 and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die the judgment of God has already been given to us so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven on judgment day we are going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we're going to be changed from mortal to immortal from corruptible to incorruptible because the judgment of God has already been made for us. And that judgment is eternal life. We have eternal life right now. Okay? And I saw thrones. Right now we are kings and priests unto God. We are a royal priesthood. We are a kingdom of priests. We are called to preach the gospel to every creature. Okay. Now, clearly, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, the souls of these people. And all this imagery is, is speaking of those of us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who gave our lives to God, who were chosen of God. All right. And this is, uh, you know, the beheading is an example of what has happened to us. Right? Beheading for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, Right? And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So, just like what I showed, uh, what I pointed to you, uh, the kingdom of God has come upon you. What verse was that here? Is that Matthew? Oh, here, maybe, uh, let me do it this way. Yeah, it was. Okay, let me find it. Give me a second. Yeah, I know, you know. All right, and the kingdom of God has come upon you. All right, so knowing that the kingdom of God is upon us right now, and knowing that we have eternal life right now, how in the world can you say that you don't live and reign with Christ right now? I mean, you're on the wrong side of the fence if you don't, if you're not living and reigning with Christ right now. Right? For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Right? So he reigns right now. And we can, I mean, come on, man. We can go to. Um, what is it? Luke 1, 
uh, verse 33, and we could see that he reigns over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So how can you say that Jesus doesn't reign right now? You're out of your you're out of your cotton picking line. You don't have any understanding whatsoever, and that that's obviously be, it has to be because you don't have any faith. Now you could be a new uh, believer, you know, and still learning and still growing. But to pretend to be a studied man, to be studied in the Word of God, and then to say that no, Christ ain't reigning right now. He reigns in the future. You're you're stupid. You're not, you know, I think you're a liar, too. That's what I think. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, what is the first resurrection? Well, this isn't, this shouldn't be confusing. You should already know. Christ is the resurrection. I mean, are you not reading did you not read? And they lived and reigned with Christ? So obviously Christ is the first resurrection. Are you completely ignorant of the scripture? Do you lack all understanding? I mean, do you not know anything? It's incredible. Christ is the first resurrection. Jesus plainly says, I am the resurrection. And here we have so many people scratching their rear ends or they're scratching their heads, scratching their armpits, whatever. Oh, I wonder what the first resurrection is. Can't figure it out. And this guy, this bozo the clown here says, well, I, I believe there's a second group of people. The first group of people are this people, and the second group of people are that people. In other words, what he's saying is Christ is a GD liar. I mean, you might as well say it. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. I, you know, not as subtle. I'll grant you that, but you might as well say it. Because it's the same thing. Jesus is the first resurrection. And Jesus is not a GD liar. You are a GD liar when you claim anybody other than Jesus is the first resurrection. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. We are partakers of his resurrection. Right now, we that are born of God, we that have the Spirit of God in us, we are partakers of his resurrection. And, uh, yeah, I, just, I feel like, why wow, we could do this all day, man. It's like, it's everywhere in the Bible everywhere we are partakers of his resurrection all right blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection so we that are born of God are partakers of his Resurrection on such the second death has no power. John 11. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The second death has no power over us that are born of God. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. 
the second death has no power over us that are born of God. And But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. They shall be priests of God and of Christ. And, he sh and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Right? And ye are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Revelation 1 and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. We are called to preach the gospel to every creature. They shall be unto me priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Yet you're going to claim that you're not reigning with Christ right now? You're not a priest of God right now? You're not a king and priest of God right now, even though the text clearly says he has made us kings and priests unto God. You're on the wrong side of the fence, pal. All right, now, verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Okay, so now, as it was before Jesus Christ was walking on the earth, it's going to be like that again. What's the major difference? Well, the major huge difference is that we're going to be up in the air. Those of us that are born of God, those of us that are saved, we're going to be transformed into our glorified bodies. We're going to be lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. Remember, ju the judgment of God has already been established for us. Now, what happens when Jesus comes? Is we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. See, ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The day of redemption is judgment day. The great day of God. Alright, so... When Jesus comes, we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Alright? I mean, it's, it's consistent all throughout the Bible. Alright? So, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord all right so in 1 Corinthians 15 let me show you a mystery behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall, been, shall put on immortality, and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. After this, after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, death is swallowed up in victory. Therefore you cannot have a bonus thousand years of guilt-free sex or whatever it is that you're preaching. Seriously. When Jesus comes, it's the end of the world, and there is no more sexual activity. All right, there is no more death, period. It's the end of the world. And Jesus will bring in his kingdom, his everlasting kingdom, and it shall be established forever. There is no more time for those that are not saved. They will be destroyed forever. So if Jesus comes back right now and you're not saved, it's too late. It's too late forever for anybody. Your only opportunity to get saved is right now. That's it. And you shouldn't be teaching anything else to anybody. There's one opportunity. It's right now. 
there's going to be a whole lot of people that are putting it off. It's going to be too late. There ain't going to be one person who's going to be able to see it and then be able to quickly get saved before it's too late. In other words, when Jesus comes, that's it. There's not going to be, all right, you got two seconds. Nope. You got one second. Nope. You got zero seconds. You ain't got no time. When it's it, it's it. When it's the end, it's the end. And there is no more opportunity to change your mind. You know, like what we see in the movie, The Left Behind. Where people are raptured up and then, you know, you got doe heads standing around. Oh, I think they got raptured. Well, this is our chance to believe. No. No, no, it's too late. It's way too late. It's going to be too late the second before we are lifted up. The second before you know, or the second before anybody knows it's the end of the world, it's too late. Once it's the end of the world, it's, you know, double zeros or whatever, it's, that's it. There is no chance. And so nobody, nobody should be teaching this idea that there's a second chance after Jesus comes. There's no chance when he is coming. There's certainly no chance after he comes. Your only opportunity is right now. So when Satan is loose, we are up in the air. All right, we are up in the air. We are changed, right? We are lifted up in the air. We are changed. And uh, this is obvious here. Oh, this is what I was going to go go to earlier when I was showing. Hey, the you know, the, and before Jesus came on earth, there's Israel on the earth, and now our holy city is above. Right when Jesus makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in Him, then. Now, our holy city is above, and uh, there is no more holy city on earth. Satan is bound now from deceiving all the nations, so therefore the city is lifted up. And uh, Jesus has gone to prepare this place for us, and he has promised to return for us, and then the holy city will come down on the earth. All right, pretty simple stuff. It's, it's uh, you know, it's spoken of all throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. So when Jesus comes back, we are lifted up in the air, and now the on the only people left on the earth are the unsaved. So we can equate that with before Jesus came, when. There was one nation of God, the children of Israel, and outside of that nation were nations deceived. Right? So now you take that nation and you lift it up into the air, and all you have on the earth are nations deceived by Satan. All right? And then so what's Satan do? He goes out to gather the unsaved, right? He gathers the unsaved at our feet. This parallels everything that we're reading all throughout the Bible. And that, I'll go back to the parable of the wheat and the tares of Matthew 13, where the... <clears throat> excuse me, though, uh, Satan gathers together the unsaved in Matthew 13. The tares are gathered into bundles and burned. Right? In Revelation 20, this gathering together is the same thing that we're reading in Matthew 13, where the tares are gathered and they are burned. Right? Satan goes out to deceive the nations to gather them together. 
and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. Remember, the beloved city is above. Right? The beloved city is above. The beloved city is above. Jerusalem, which is above, is free. So they compass the camp of the saints about. We are up in the air. We are in the beloved city, up in the air. We are with the Lord Jesus. Right? We are changed in a moment in time. See, we're, we are lifted up, caught up together with them in the clouds. First the dead in Christ, then those of us which are alive and remain. We're caught up together with them in the clouds. Right? And then so we're up in the air. Our enemy is at our feet. Right? We're up in the air and our enemy is at their feet gathered at our feet right and what's it saying genesis 3 verse 15 it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel that's the end of the world god will stomp his foot on the head of the serpent fire came down from god out of heaven and devoured him it's the end of the world and this is all throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible, we're learning about this. We're, we're hearing about this. You put all these, you connect all these dots, and you realize how simple all of this it really is. And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Right? For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet right and it's all throughout the bible it's pretty amazing revelation 3 verse 9 behold i will make them to come and worship before thy feet see they're at our feet our enemy is at our feet and they're going to know that god has loved us we're up in the air right we're up in the air with the lord when this happens it's the end of the world we are changed we are put our in our glorified bodies and all evil is destroyed before us and this is consistent all, all throughout the bible now uh, i'm going to end it there and so quick note here um the beast and the false prophet we read about that in revelation 19 Verse 10 is simply telling us that the devil is cast in the lake of fire, just like what we read in chapter 19. It's not a thousand years after. All right. Don't be stupid. I mean, P, I, I really think people are will, willingly being stupid when they say, oh, no, that was a thousand years later. No. You're missing the parallels, man. You're not connecting the dots, and you should be. You're lacking understanding, and I think you lack understanding because you lack faith. That's what I think. This is giving us an example, letting us know that this is the same moment. That when the devil's thrown in the lake of fire, it's the same thing that we read in Revelation 19. All right. The great white throne, that's Jesus. It's nobody else. It's not Muhammad. It's not you. It's the Lord coming in the clouds of heaven. It's the judgment day. All right, and then on Judgment Day, it's not just, okay, hey, you're evil, so you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire, right? Everything that is evil is going to be done away with. All right, all things that are bad are done away with forever. All right, and of course, um, it's so it's not just unsafe people being judged. It's everything bad is going to be done away with. And then, of course, uh, when this happens, Jesus says, Behold, 
I make all things new.